for the most part in the United States, the churches are allowed <sighs> We've always been allowed. The fact that I even have to say it that way is ridiculous. What's up YouTube, Ryan here. Welcome back to 1517 Films, where in every episode I am always contending for the faith, once for all, delivered to the saints. And on this episode, we're talking about civil disobedience. Stick around. So before we get to the topic today, a couple of logistical things that need to be addressed. The poll results are in for the episode that is going to thank you, the viewer, for getting me to 1,000 subscribers. The poll results are in. We will be discussing a critique of false doctrine. <laughs> the one thing I didn't want to do. But I think, I think I've found a way to address this issue, this, this idea of critiquing false doctrine. I've chosen a false doctrine that I think it doesn't matter what Christian denomination you're a part of, we can all agree this is a false doctrine. And I think I want to change focus on how I critique false doctrine, not to just point a finger and go, heresy, and leave it at that. I think I want to point out the false doctrine, point out some of the flaws in how that doctrine was achieved, and then put the focus on what is pure doctrine and why the pure doctrine is better for the Christian and society as, as a whole than the false doctrine. So if we spend more time promoting what is true and what we love than critiquing what is false and what we hate, I think it's a better way to critique false doctrine. So you voted critique false doctrine and in the next video, we will. If you're new to the channel, I want to recommend that you subscribe. There's lots of cool content. And there's definitely a string of, of popular videos that people enjoy. The kind of Christian theology and practicality of Christianity that I think most Christians are afraid to address today. Things like rosaries and incense and home altars and stuff like that. So check it out. There's also some chanting. There's some sermons. There's some Bible studies. So check it out. Uh, definitely ring the notification bell because we all know Ryan's flighty about how he uploads. I apologize. I have personal things going on. I have things going on all around me. I hope I have settled on a schedule that gets me to post the two to three times a week that I normally do. Maybe the channel needs a reboot. I don't know, but we'll figure it out. On this episode though, we're using the story of the Canadian pastor who called the police Nazis and eventually ended up being arrested. We're using that story as a catalyst for a larger conversation. Now, I hate to say we're using it. Um, I've done a lot of research on this. I'm glad I held off on talking about this topic because, well, let's face it. Let's be honest. The propaganda machine was in full swing on this one from both sides of the aisle. This is Christian persecution. And from the mainstream media, not much. Eh, they got bigger fish to fry than this, so we're just going to sweep this one under the rug. The bigger question is, is this Christian persecution by the government? And the bigger question than that is, what are we as Christians supposed to do, especially in light of Romans 13, which says obey the governing authorities. Now, I have talked about this already in a previous video from Lutheran Lemonade, go check that out, where I talked about a, a, a hair salon owner who was suing her local government because her hair salon is a ministry and the mandates for, for the um, Dem Panic, I'm not going to say what it actually is because I don't want Susan to take down my video. So we're just going to call it the Dem Panic. Um, the Dem Panic restrictions on her business were an infringement upon her free exercise of religion. I call bullshit on that. You are a for-profit business. You're not a ministry. So, and so I was very heavy on the uh, obey the governing authorities. But we're not talking about a for-profit business at this point. Now we're talking about a church, which is an actual ministry. And I've been very careful in how I choose to research this. I don't want to know the denomination. I don't want to know what the doctrines of the church are. <clears throat> I don't want to know how they choose to worship. These are things that I would otherwise critique on this channel, but I don't want to get distracted by them, so I have deliberately ignored these facts. What we are looking at in general terms is a Christian church where the pastor confronted the police about a month ago and now has been arrested. So as a refresher, let's take a look at some of that footage. Do you understand English? 
Get out of this property. Go. So go. Go. And don't come back without a warrant. Out, Nazi. Out. Out. You understand? Nazis are not welcome here. Out. And don't come back without a warrant. You're a uh, name officer. Now, I am not necessarily on the side of this is Christian persecution. I'm not not on that side, but I'm certainly not fully on that side. I'm somewhere in the middle on this. I think there are better examples of Christian persecution under the Dem Panic in the United States than there are than this one in Canada. Now, before we get to the Romans 13 thing, there's a couple of things I want us to consider. Both sides of the story here. I want us to consider, could this pastor have accommodated the mandates? Could this pastor have had more services? I don't know. Depending on the denomination, depending on the, the preaching style, depending on the, the type of worship service, maybe not. I mean, for us Lutherans, it's really easy. Our service is an hour, an hour and a half long, maybe, so we can have more services. And many Lutherans are having more services. Some Lutherans have had hundreds of services above and beyond what they normally have to accommodate these mandates that we can't have max capacity in the building anymore. Some churches in the United States went as far as to have their people meet in the parking lot in their cars and listen to the preacher via radio, and that wasn't good enough. And that, I think, serves as a better example of actual persecution against the church than, than this pastor who, for whatever reason, didn't look to see, well, and I don't know, didn't look to see if he could accommodate that. And I don't know if, if I don't know how the, the politics of this church works. In the Lutheran church, we have elders. So the pastor is not the end-all, be-all king of the castle in the church. There's a board of elders and a church council that the pastor is um, subject to. So it, it evens itself out that way. It's a good way to govern a church. <clears throat> and so for the... Um, uh, ooh, I almost called it what it was. Uh, for the Dem Panic, uh, at least in, in my church, uh, the pastor worked with the council, worked with the board of elders to come up with what we thought in our local congregation was reasonable to accommodate the mandates. And on a, on a state level, so the kingdom of the church has decided thusly, on a state level, the kingdom of the state has issued these mandates. And we're trying to, I don't know, have our cake and eat it too. So I, there is room for compromise and accommodation for these mandates. And on the state level, at least in Wisconsin, where I live, our governing bodies went to the courts and ruled much of what our governor did unconstitutional, according to the constitution of the state of Wisconsin. And so restrictions have been lifted. We are getting back to the way things have always been before this dem panic. So maybe this pastor could have, could have done something to accommodate the mandates in his local community. Community, I don't know. I'm not that pastor. I'm not inside his head. But the other side of the coin. Now here's the other side of the story. I think as Christians, we're all familiar with the concept that the pastor is an under shepherd to our great shepherd, which is Christ. So, at least in the Lutheran tradition... Gosh, that sun is really bright, isn't it? It's not even shining in that window. All right. 
So in the Lutheran Church, during the Easter season, we have a Sunday called Good Shepherd Sunday. And we read the 23rd Psalm, we sing the King of Love, my shepherd is. It's all about Jesus as the Good Shepherd. And I think most Christians can agree that pastors are under shepherds to Christ who is the Great Shepherd. And so when we read Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He restores my soul. Um, all of that. And we get to the part, um, he leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Um, uh, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I shall fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Now, on Good, on Good Shepherd Sunday, we're going to hear all about that staff. That's the big shepherd staff, the big, the big, the candy cane looking thing. And they use that to grab a wayward sheep and pull it back into the fold. And while that might not feel good for the sheep, that is an act of pastoral love to go after that one lost sheep and bring it back into the fold. Nope, come here, you little bastard. Back in you go. What about the staff? I think what we've seen in this first video of the pastor yelling at the police I think is an example of the pastor not wielding the staff, but the rod. Now, as I said earlier, it's difficult for us Lutherans because our pastors are, are under the uh, board of elders and the uh, church council as far as leadership is going, but you are shepherds. And I think uh, in America, at least, we do have a problem where shep our shepherds are unwilling to wield the rod because their posture rests lazily on the staff. That is just my opinion. So I think at a minimum, what we saw here was a shepherd fighting off the wolves on behalf of his congregation. I mean, and there is plenty other examples of why pastors, you need to be more on the ball about wielding the rod. They are coming into the churches now to try to shoot us while we worship. And while I definitely have a Glock on me while I'm in church, what are you going to do to defend your sheep? You're the shepherd. Yes, you are supposed to lead them beside quiet waters. You are supposed to minister to them, love them, have that shepherd and servant heart towards them. You're also called to beat off the wolves. So I think... I think testosterone has always been a qualifier for the pastoral office and a set of balls has literally been a qualifier for the pastoral office. You have to have testicles. But at this point, I think we're getting to a place where seminarians should have to drop their pants. And if you have below average size balls, fuck off, Toby. You can't be a pastor. We need pastors with balls. We need men to lead this church because Things are going to get ugly. And I don't say that based on what's going on in the world. I say that based on the promises of Jesus, that things are going to get bad. There will be trial. There will be tribulation. If they hated you, it's because they hate me. If they persecuted me, what do you think they're going to do to you? Jesus promises this and calls his shepherds to nut up. Now, regarding civil disobedience, <clears throat> in an earlier video, I, I talked about a woman who's, who said that her hair salon was a ministry and these uh, dem panic mandates were an infringement upon her First Amendment right to the free exercise of religion. I disagreed with her, her assessment on that. And I pointed out Romans 13, obey the governing authorities. I still hold to Romans 13 Obey the governing authorities, but, and this is, this is the part that's going to be conversational. This is just me bouncing ideas off, and I am interested in hearing back about what you think. If you're a pastor, what do you think? If you're a theologian, what do you think? If you're not Lutheran, if you're Presbyterian Methodist, what do you think? If you're a fundamentalist, what do you think? I'm just a conservative, confessional Orthodox Lutheran, and Augsburg Catholic. That's what I am. So here's kind of my opinion piece. And I can't speak to Canada. I don't know what their laws are. I don't know what their rights are. But in the United States, our founding fathers wrote down in a 
epic breakup letter to the king these words, We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, and that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights. Among these, the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men. So this idea of the Founding Fathers, which they intended to be a global, universal, self-evident, which means painstakingly obvious idea, is that we are granted our rights by God. And it is the function of the government to secure those rights. Later on in our history, we went and wrote down these words. We, the people of the United States of America, in order to form a more perfect union, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense, promote the general welfare, and secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and to our posterity, to ordain and establish this Constitution of the United States of America. And we laid down what is fundamentally the highest law of the land, the Constitution. This is the highest law of the land, and the highest law of the land names we the people as the sovereign. We the people do this. We are in charge. We are the boss. We have the authority. This principle is in the Declaration of, of Independence. When a government becomes uh, contrary to this, to this, it, oh gosh, I'm forgetting the words. Uh, it is the right of the people to overthrow such government and to provide new guards for their future security. This, and it, it was unbiblical. The revolution was unbiblical as far as Romans 13 is concerned. But the reality you and I as Christians live in today is that we live under the Constitution of the United States of America, which names us the sovereign. So whatever that beady-eyed, mumbling jackass hiding in our house, which he caged off, says, well, we the people are the government, that's not true. And that should be terrifying to you and to me that that beady-eyed dementia patient says that him and his lackeys that have walled us off from our house and he cowers behind it like a little sniveling runt, he says he's in charge. He's not. We are. And we can petition our government for redress, which is a part of the First Amendment to the Constitution of the United States. And the First Amendment... Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof or abridging the freedom of speech or of the press or the right of the people peaceably to assemble and to petition the government for a redress of grievances. Now, the, the, the Bill of Rights doesn't grant us this right. This right exists for us already. It is the function of the government to secure this right. So, here's my new thought. Let me know what you think. As far as being Christian in the United States, as far as obeying the governing authorities, I think it's high time that we as Christians familiarize ourselves with constitutional law. I think it's time we read and reread and reread the Constitution. I think it's time we read and reread and reread the Bill of Rights. I think it's time we study what our rights are. We learn how our government is supposed to work under the authority of the highest governing authority in the land, the Constitution. I am starting to think that civil disobedience towards local government is obedience to the ultimate governing authority, the Constitution of the United States. The Declaration of Independence, the Bill of Rights. Obedience to these governing authorities, these three, sometimes requires, in the language of these three documents, that we disobey the government when they violate our rights because they are not there to violate them they are there to secure them 
So if you're a church in California that is attempting to maintain COVID restrictions and you have your congregation meeting in the cars, in the parking lot, and listening on the radio, and you still have the popos banging on your door, sue them. If you can't accommodate reasonable measures, you still have the right to the free exercise of religion, and it is the government that cannot infringe upon it. Sue them. I know this opens up a whole new can of worms about Christians and frivolous lawsuits, but we need to be paying attention to what is going on. While on one side, I believe that American Christians have grown fat and complacent on the freedom and liberty that we enjoy in this country, I also see the writing on the wall and the promises of Jesus that this is starting to be taken away. Baby steps. Death by a thousand cuts. A dog chained to a dog house where once a year the owner goes out and removes a link and after a long time the dog goes, what the hell? I think we're at the what the hell phase right now. Our rights have been slowly, slowly, methodically taken away. And now we're five inches from the doghouse going, when the hell did this happen? It's time to stand up. As Christians, it's time to understand what our rights are according to the Constitution, what rights we already have, and what rights it is the responsibility of our government to support and defend on our behalf because in America that's the function of government. I also think it's high time that pastors nut up and start beating off the wolves that are coming for us. That's your job. And you need, a, like I said, it's difficult for Lutherans because we govern our churches very differently from other church bodies. We have a board of elders and a council. I don't care. These are conversations that pastors and councils and elders need to start having. You need to stop leaning on the staff and start learning how to whip that rod around. Going back to the original story here, I don't like how this went down. I was very impressed by the first video calling them Nazis, calling them communists, telling them to get the hell out of his church. That was a pastor with a set of cojones on him. But I don't know all the details. I don't know whether or not he could have accommodated. And the fact that the video footage is from his perspective and not the police officers makes me wonder. I'm trying to be objective. Now I have, where did I put it? Right here. If you don't have this book, I highly recommend it. The Apostolic Fathers, the writings of the earliest Christians from the first several centuries of the church, and in the narrative of the martyrdom of Polycarp, we read about Quintus. And they write of Quintus in uh, chapter 4, this was a man who had forced himself on some others to come forward voluntarily. The pro council after many appeals, finally persuaded him to swear an oath and to offer the sacrifice. For this reason, therefore, brothers and sisters, we do not praise those who hand themselves over, since the gospel does not so teach. Now, this might not be the clearest example of it, but um, in the martyrdom of Polycarp, it does talk about um, Christians who were seeking out martyrdom. They were seeking out persecution and under the weight of it, they crumbled and fell. This narrative to me does smell a little bit like someone seeking out martyrdom. And, 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 and I know what the opposition says. Oh my goodness. It's just a mask. Oh my goodness, it's just six feet. Do you know what it was in the first several centuries? It was, oh my goodness, it's just a pinch of incense. All you have to do is offer up a pinch of incense and say, Caesar is Lord. You don't even have to mean it. Just do it. No, Karen. 
Absolutely not. Absolutely not. And in Polycarp's day, there were Christians who were being a little too upfront and flashy about what they were doing so they could get caught, so they could be martyrs. And in the end, guess what? They crumbled under the weight of martyrdom and they apostated. So this example in Canada is starting to smell a little bit like that to me. That's just how I feel about this issue. Christians, we need to pay attention. We need to start studying the laws of our land because it's important. If we want to maintain fidelity to the scriptures and obedience to Christ and keep Romans 13, then we need to understand what the position of power is for our governing authorities, what rights are granted to us by God that they are supposed to be securing, and understand that in this country, in the United States of America, we have the right to petition the government for a redress of grievances. We have the right to peacefully assemble. We have the right to free exercise of religion. And so when these rights granted to us by God, which are supposed to be secured by the government, are being infringed upon by the government, maybe not big government, maybe not Congress, but when the local governing bodies are using a tragedy to strip you temporarily of your rights for safety. Know your rights. Know your rights. That's what I am pleading with us as Christians to start doing. If we want to be faithful to Romans 13 and obey the governing authorities, we need to start thinking of the Declaration of Independence, the Constitution of the United States, and the Bill of Rights as the highest governing authority, and our fidelity needs to be to that. Not fallible men who can twist it and misinterpret it for social, economic, and political gain. So that's my new stance. I stand in obedience to the Declaration of Independence, to the Constitution of the United States, and to the Bill of Rights. And I stand as a layperson looking the shepherds of multiple flocks around this country and telling them to grow a pair and learn to wield the rod a little bit. You need to defend your wolves. And I get it. You're pastors. You have to be a little bit more pragmatic. You have to be a little bit more diplomatic. You have to be a little bit more compassionate. You have to have a calm demeanor. You're a shepherd. I understand you have a staff. You need to understand that God gave you a rod. You have to learn to do both. All of this is not about what is right or what is wrong. All of this is about the conversation we need to be having as Christians. That's where it starts. We need to have an honest and sincere dialogue amongst ourselves about what we're going to do moving forward. So while this certain incident from Canada does smell a little bit like someone making a murder of himself, I will also say this. It's incredibly suspicious that it's happening this late in the game. This late into the Dem Panic, really? A year plus into the Dem Panic? A year plus after 15 days to flatten the curve and Canada is still pulling this shit? That also seems suspicious to me. For the most part in the United States, the churches are allowed to... We've always been allowed. The fact that I even have to say it that way is ridiculous. At this point in the Dem Panic in the United States, the churches are making their own decision. They're governing themselves. They're exercising their free right of religion. It is up to religious people to determine how they exercise their religion. This is a right that has been granted to us by God and is supposed to be being protected by the government. But you got beady-eyed Bobo the Clown hiding in our house telling us that he's the boss and his, his government lackeys are the boss. No, sir. We the people. It's going to come down to it. I don't know when. Maybe not me. 
hopefully not my children, but it's going to come down to it eventually where we're going to have to stand trial. Jesus promises this. I base that statement on his words and not what I'm watching happen in front of me. Because as the Bible says, let God be true and every man a liar. And circumstances and situations and paradigms may change and shift one way or the other. They always do. But Jesus' words stand secure. So we need to start having this conversation with ourselves right now. What are we going to do? What are our rights? How are we going to act? What is the church going to look like when they force us underground? What is our statement of faith going to be when we stand trial? More importantly, even than that, what effect does this have on the nuclear family? That is the, the highest, highest governing authority. Higher even, I think, than the Constitution. The nuclear family. How am I going to hand this faith, once for all delivered to the saints, to my children? How am I going to catechize my children? How am I going to teach them to stand in defense of what is unequivocally true? That Jesus was crucified, dead, buried, raised again from the dead, ascended into heaven, and sits at the right hand of the Father, pleading on our behalf for mercy. How am I going to give that to my children? How am I going to teach them to stand that up? That needs to happen first. Then we need to have a conversation amongst ourselves as Christians. How are we going to stand up and defend our rights and not give way to propaganda on either side? We need to stop jumping to, we're being persecuted. We need to step back and do a little research. Because the more research I did on this topic, the more I realized, I think he's just looking to be a martyr. And we need to determine what is going to be our confession of faith if and when we have to stand trial. Me, I've got it sorted. Unless I am convinced by scripture and by plain reason and not by Congress or Senate House or President or Supreme Court, which always contradict themselves, my conscience is captive to the Word of God. And to go against a conscience captive to the Word of God is neither right nor safe. So I cannot, I will not recant my faith. Here I stand. I cannot do otherwise. God help me. Amen. What's yours? Until next time, may God richly bless you. In the grace and mercy won for you by Jesus' vicarious death on the cross for all of your sins.